The passage for tonight is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. So if you find 1 Thessalonians and the second chapter. So let us hear the word of God. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, We speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, nor from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, But we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dwelt with each of you, we dealt with each of you, as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Amen. Paul, together with Silas and Timothy, is writing to the young church in Thessalonica. They're on the second missionary journey. You remember how after they'd visited the believers in Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, they travelled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept from going west into the province of Asia. They tried to go north and east into Bithynia, but were told the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. They passed by Mysia, and they eventually ended up at the coast at Troas. They could go no further. Then that very night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. The next morning, the missionaries consulted together and they concluded that God had called them to Macedonia and they set off immediately. They arrived soon in Philippi. There wasn't even a Jewish synagogue in Philippi. However, it wasn't long before several people were converted and a church was planted. And then, as you know well, Paul and Silas were arrested beaten up, thrown into prison. There was a midnight earthquake. The jailer was converted. The next day, the missionaries were asked politely to leave. They passed through Amphipolis and Ampollonia, and they came to Thessalonica. Paul's strategy, it seems, his God-given strategy, was to concentrate on the cities. Plant growing churches in the cities and the gospel would explode out into the surrounding countryside. Well, Paul was only in Thessalonica for some three weeks before the Jews rounded up some bad characters, formed a mob, started a riot. He accused the missionaries of causing trouble all over the world. It's quite a claim. Defying Caesar's decrees saying there is another king, one called Jesus. 
And again, the missionaries had to leave after three weeks. They went to Berea. Then Paul fled to Athens. Timothy was sent back to Thessalonica. Paul moved on to Corinth. And when Timothy joined him there, bringing news from the Thessalonians, Paul wrote to them this letter. So they've only been Christians for two years at the most. A young, young church. The purpose of the letter was to encourage the new converts, to give instruction about godly living, to urge them not to neglect their daily work, to give assurances concerning the future of believers who died before Christ returned. Now we noted in our first study in chapter 1, the early verses of chapter 1, how Paul, in the introduction, stressed the security of that baby church. Remember, they were in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. There was their double security. In God and in Christ. And we noted the marks of that living church. Faith, hope and love. Their faith in Christ was seen in their works, in what they did, how they lived. Their love for Christ and for one another was evidenced by their labor, their hard work, and their hope in Christ was seen in that it produced endurance, stickability, the ability to take the strain and get under the weight of what was happening. We today here in St. George's Tron have that same security as a church. We are in God and we're in Jesus Christ. We need to ask ourselves if these marks of a living church are being seen in us. Is our faith and our love and our hope being seen to those around us? Then last week, in the second half of chapter 1, we noted how Paul knew that God had chosen these Thessalonians. How Paul was convinced, if you like, that a genuine work of God, of grace, had taken place in those three brief weeks in Thessalonica. How do you know? Well, first of all, he knew because of what he had experienced himself. How the gospel came, he says to them, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Yes, Paul had spoken the word, He'd gone to the synagogue on three Sabbaths. He'd reasoned from the scriptures. He'd explained and proved that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead and that Jesus was, in fact, the Christ. Paul had spoken. But in a quite remarkable and unforgettable way, those words had come over with power, with the Holy Spirit's power. It was as if the Holy Spirit himself had taken Paul's words and breathed into them. And at the same time, Paul himself was given a real conviction about what he was saying. And immediately things began to happen. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined them, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and not a few, that means many, prominent women. Now that wasn't due to Paul's oratory or Paul's persuasive powers. He'd preach his heart out in other places and not much had happened. Here in Thessalonica, there was an awakening, a special movement of the Spirit of God. And that's what convinced Paul that God had chosen them. Second thing that convinced Paul that God had chosen them was what happened to the Thessalonians. We read how they welcomed the message with joy, whilst at the same time they put up with severe suffering, joy and suffering together. They became imitators of the missionaries and of the Lord. They became a working model to all the believers in that area, 
a model of a truly evangelistic church with the Lord's message ringing out from them, we read. And a model of what it means to be truly converted. It means to turn from idols. It means serving the living and true God. It means waiting for Jesus. Trusting him to rescue us from the coming wrath. And as Paul saw what had happened to the Thessalonians, he knew that God had chosen them as well. Now we need to remember that this letter, as with all Paul's letters, this letter was written to a church, to a group of individual believers together. We so often tend to read them as if they were just written to individuals. This was written to a church. I wonder if someone looking at our church, at us together, would conclude that God had chosen us for these same reasons. That we welcome the message with joy and yet we're willing to suffer. That we became imitators of other believers and of the Lord. That the Lord's message is ringing out from us. That we are demonstrating to all that we have turned from our idols to serve the living God and to wait for Jesus to come again. The heading of this section is Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. The heading in our Bibles, that is. And it seems as if, in this chapter, Paul is defending his conduct whilst he was with them there. Now we've already mentioned that that brief mission to Thessalonica came to an abrupt end. There was a public riot. There were legal charges against them, so serious that they were persuaded to make a humiliating night flight from the city. And it seems that Paul's critics took full advantage of his sudden disappearance. In order to undermine his authority and his gospel, they determined to discredit him. And so, they launched a smear campaign. He's run away. We haven't seen or heard of him since. He's insincere. He's impelled by the basest of motives, you know. He's a charlatan. He's just in it for what he can get out of it. Prestige, power, money. He doesn't care about you Thessalonians. He's abandoned you. And it seems that, if, that some of the Thessalonians were being carried away by these lies. For some, I guess, it sounded pretty plausible. But Paul, when he heard about it, found such an attack very painful. Yes, he knew that Jesus had been misrepresented. They called Jesus a glutton and a wine-bibber and a, a lawbreaker. They charged Jesus of being in league with the devil, even of being mad. But Paul wanted to reply, not, not just to justify himself, but because the truth of the gospel and the future of the church were at stake. And so in this chapter, he defends his conduct. Later, he'll explain his departure and his inability to go back and his determination to visit them again as soon as he can. But, having said that, and he does do that, he's doing far more than that. He's doing far more than simply defending his conduct. The chapter begins with the word for or because. It's missing. It's missing in the NIV here. Because you know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. It's verse 1 is really an explanation of something in chapter 1. And you'll know that chapters weren't there in the original. They just flowed on one verse to the next. So what's being explained here? Well, it's that word visit. That word visit in verse 1 could be entrance. 
That's the clue. Because the same word occurs in verse 9 of the first chapter, where it's translated reception. For they report what kind of reception you gave us. That's really a wrong translation. It should be entrance. Now, we've already mentioned what an extraordinarily fruitful thing that visit, that entrance, Paul going to Thessalonica was. It was nothing less than a visitation from the Lord, an outpouring of the Spirit as they turned from idols to serve the living and true God. It resulted in lasting, real conversions. Well, here's the link. Paul is going to explain from his side how his visit, how his coming to them was not a failure. That means was a success. I'm going to explain how my visit to you was so successful. Now, of course, this is God's work. And we can never dictate how God will come down in mighty blessing. Paul knew that. All he's doing here is saying that this is the story from his perspective. I'm sure we're all a bit fed up of hearing these statistics about church decline. Well, here tonight, listen, we have Paul's outline for church growth. The secret of real, practical, lasting conversions. In verse 2, he reminds them what he had done when he'd come to them. With the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel. Now, that should be translated, as it is in verse 8, the gospel of God. We dare to tell you the gospel of God. What did he do when he came to them? He told them the gospel of God. Yes, he'd suffered previously and been insulted in Philippi. Yes, they'd faced strong opposition in Thessalonica. But they did just the same. He says, we told you, we chatted among you, that's what the word means, we chatted among you the gospel of God. Wasn't some clever message that Paul had made up? This was the message that he'd been given. It was the truth. It came from God himself. It's the gospel of God. And he says, we dared to tell it to you. That word dared means to speak openly, freely, fearlessly, outspokenly, frankly, plainly. In other words, they'd come publicly, they'd spoken openly, they'd hidden nothing. What Paul is saying is that the basic thing they'd done was to openly speak about the gospel of God. They hadn't come with good advice or with counseling or with support. They hadn't come to debate or to dialogue about the religious trends of the day and discuss the relative merits of other religions. They'd come to tell people openly and frankly about the gospel of God, about what God had done in Christ to save them about the death and resurrection of Jesus. <laughs> now that sounds pretty basic, doesn't it? Well, it is. But it's still the foundation of any effective work of God today. We must be telling, openly and plainly, the gospel of God. It'll still involve suffering and opposition because it's not what people want to hear. It's not, these days, what they expect the church to be doing. But this is what we must do. That's the first thing. What Paul did. And then in verses uh, 3 to 12, Paul outlines how he did it. How he told the people the gospel of God. And here, he likens himself to three different people. To a steward to a mother, and to a father. In verses 3 and 4, he's comparing himself to a steward. Now, if you look carefully, the word steward doesn't appear. 
But the idea of stewardship is right there in that phrase, entrusted with the gospel. The idea was that God had entrusted the gospel to Paul just as a householder entrusts his property to a steward, to the household manager. And Paul certainly uses that idea in Galatians and 1 Timothy and Titus. But before he develops the idea, he has in verse 3 some negative disclaimers to make. Verse 3, first, his appeal in telling the gospel of God does not spring from error, he says. That was the case because the message, the gospel of God, was true. Secondly, it wasn't due to impure motives. That single Greek word means impurity or uncleanness. Now that could refer to sexual immorality and it's possible that Paul's detractors were hinting at this. It was common apparently amongst travelling teachers of the time. But probably it refers to evils such as ambition and pride and greed and popularity. And thirdly, Paul says his appeal was not made with guile, nor are we trying to trick you. That is, there was nothing devious about their methods. They weren't trying to induce conversions by either concealing the cost of discipleship or by offering great blessings. Well, that's quite a claim, isn't it? My message is true, my motives are pure, my methods are open and above board. Paul's conscience was clear. He was free from anything underhand. And over against that, over against error, impurity, guile, Paul develops this stewardship metaphor. Verse 4, on the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You see, his emphasis is on God as the person who, to whom he's responsible, as a steward was responsible to the master of the house. God, he says, had approved him. That word means put to the test, to examine, especially to accept as proof, to approve. It means to test and find genuine. It's a word used for coins or for people. God had tested Paul and found him fit. Secondly, as a result of the successful test, God had entrusted him with the gospel, making him a steward of it. Thirdly, God was the person he was trying to please, not men. And fourthly, it was God. It is God who tests our hearts, who goes on testing our hearts, he says. So we speak, says Paul, we tell the gospel as men who are tested by God, approved by God, trusted by God, and are seeking to please God. In other words, we are God-centered. Stewards of the gospel are primarily responsible neither to the church nor to its leaders, but to God himself. Now that's in one sense very disconcerting because God sees our hearts and our secrets. In another sense, it's very liberating because God is more impartial and merciful than any human being or church court. To be accountable to God is to be delivered from the tyranny of human criticism. So Paul came to them, first of all, as a steward, a steward seeking to be faithful to God. And then he says he came also as a mother. This is the second metaphor, verses 5 to 8. Again, he begins negatively, verse 5. You know that we never used flattery. We never sought to gain influence over you for selfish ends. Nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. We don't pretend to serve whilst in reality we're wanting to be served. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or for anyone else. We aren't hungry for compliments. In other words, Paul's saying he wasn't seeking to build himself up. 
by flattery, covering up wrong motives, or looking for praise. Nor was he seeking, he says, to be a burden to the Thessalonians. Now, as an apostle, he could have been. He could have asserted his authority and issued orders. He could have insist, insisted on being paid. But no, he resisted that. Instead, verse 7, we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. Think of that. Who? Who could be more gentle than a mother caring for her little children? Look how tenderly she, she handles them. How she comes down to their level. How she uses their language. How she plays their games. And not only was he gentle, like a mother. He says he was affectionate and sacrificial as well. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, there it is again, but our very lives as well, because you'd become so dear to us. So far from using them to minister to himself, he gave himself to minister to them. You know, some people think it's strange that Paul, a man, and a tough man at times, should use this sort of feminine metaphor. But he does. He reminds them that he came to them not in a self-centered, demanding way, but gently, affectionately, sacrificially, just like a mother with her young children. So he came as a faithful steward, a gentle mother. And the third picture he uses is that of a father, verses 9 to 12. Again, he he begins negatively. He mentions again that he had not been a burden to anyone in Thessalonica while he preached the gospel of God to them, verse 9. Indeed, he was in order deliberately to avoid being dependent on them financially that he and his companions had worked, he says, night and day. Probably preached by day and worked by night. Probably by tent making. They surely remembered his toil and hardship. No, instead of being a burden to them, he'd been like a father to them, he says, by both example and instruction. As for his example... He says, they and God were witnesses together how holy, righteous, and blameless he had been among the believers. Holy refers to his being devout and pious and pleasing to God. Righteous refers to his dealings with others. Blameless refers to his public reputation. In other words, he set them a consistent example of how to live. And then verse 11, we dealt with each of you individually as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, that's the old word for comfort, spurring them on to action and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. That word urging means bearing testimony, witnessing to the truth. This is the instruction side of things, you see. He wasn't only setting them an example, he was teaching them. And teaching them what? Teaching them to live lives worthy of God who calls them into his kingdom and glory. Calls them into his kingdom now and into his glory then. Living lives worthy of their calling means living in the light of their present dignity and their future destiny. So far from burdening them, Paul was like an encouraging father, setting a consistent example and teaching them how to live. So why was Paul's visit to them not a failure, but a glorious success? Well, one answer, of course, would be that there was an unusual visitation of the Spirit of God. God came down in great blessing. God was at work. Yes, undoubtedly. But God 
works in and through his chosen instruments. And so Paul here gives us his side of things. He tells, he tells us what he did when he came to them. He openly, plainly, fearlessly told them the gospel of God. He told them what God had done for them in Christ. Doesn't faith come by hearing the message of Christ? And then he tells us how he came to them with that gospel. He came as a faithful steward, one entrusted with the gospel, accountable to God alone. That means, you see, he didn't add anything to the gospel message. He didn't subtract from the gospel message. He didn't in any way try to make it less demanding or more attractive. He came guarding the gospel carefully. He came as a gentle mother with a real concern for these people. He got down to their level. He gave himself to them. He came explaining the gospel simply. And he came as an encouraging father, showing them, teaching them how to live lives worthy of God. He came living the gospel clearly. And as a faithful steward, a gentle mother, and an encouraging father, notice this, he came with a with a dedicated, committed life, with a heart under divine approval. He came willing to share his very life with them. He came living a holy, righteous, and blameless life. We could say, in a sentence, that Paul came with the gospel wrapped up in a holy life. What lessons can we learn from these verses tonight? Well, it seems to me it's pretty obvious that Paul was thrilled by what had happened in Thessalonica. He wanted to remind them about it. You know that our coming to you was not a failure. You know what a tremendous thing happened in those few days. And he tells them about it. I wonder if we need to be reminded of that day or those days when the Lord came into our lives. That day when the Lord opened your eyes. That day when the Lord brought you to himself. Do we need to be reminded of those days in the past when God came down in unusual blessing on his people and there was an awakening. Sinclair reminded us last week when he asked us, have we stopped praying for these awakenings to happen now? Why isn't there more pleading with the Lord for people to be converted? Have we lost our desire to see souls saved? Have we lost the thrill of our salvation? I think that's the first thing we can learn from these verses. To recapture the thrill of God at work. Changing lives. Second thing is this. Do we have confidence in the gospel, the gospel of God? The good news about Jesus is God's gospel. Do we really believe that it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes? If we did, then we'd be wanting to see this gospel told in our city. We'd be much in prayer for our 30-minute service on a Wednesday, for our services on Sunday as the gospel is told. The third lesson, if this is how Paul came to the Thessalonians and God so wonderfully blessed, then shouldn't we be wanting and praying for 
our ministers to come to us like this, like faithful stewards guarding the gospel carefully, like gentle mothers explaining the gospel simply, like encouraging fathers demonstrating and teaching the gospel clearly. But you know, so many people expect other things, don't they? They expect the minister to be a good visitor and a good counselor and a good organizer and good with the children and good with the grannies and everything else. Will you pray for us? Sing for myself that we'll be faithful as stewards, gentle as mothers, encouraging as fathers as we guard and explain and live out the gospel. There's a fourth lesson in these verses because I don't think this is just for ministers. We're all called to go somewhere to the shop, to the office, to our studies, to our homes. We're all on the move and we're all to tell the gospel of God. In verse 7 of the first chapter, Paul says that these young believers in Thessalonica have become a model to all believers and one aspect of that in verse 8 was that the Lord's message rang out from them. Their faith had become known everywhere. That ought to be happening with us. But what Paul is saying here, I believe, is that things happen. God is more likely to come down in blessing when that message, that gospel, is wrapped up in a holy life. And that applies to all of us, doesn't it? The quality of our life as a people of God, the quality of our life commends the reality of our message. Well, there's a challenge, isn't it? Do we want our church to grow? Do we? Do we want to see people converted? Well, the first thing is that we must pray and pray and pray that God will come down and use your blessing upon us. Because only he can turn people around. Only he can give new life. We must pray. But then we must tell the gospel. Simply. Carefully. Encouragingly. Clearly. And we must wrap it up in a holy life. Let's pray together. Father, we've been reminded again tonight that in those first days of that church in Thessalonica, you came down in an unusual, mighty way. Lord, we would long for these days again here in the city of Glasgow, here in our own church, that you would come down amongst us and we would cry to you, O Lord, for you to come in mighty renewing power. That your spirit would be pleased to work in our midst Sunday by Sunday, Wednesday by Wednesday, But Lord, we've been reminded tonight that our part of that is to be telling the gospel, having confidence in the gospel of God. Lord, help us to really know the gospel ourselves. 
to be ready to give an answer to the hope that's in us, to be ready to speak about Jesus. And also, to wrap it all up in a holy, blameless life. Oh Lord, we, we confess that we do fall short so often. We're so taken up with our own petty concerns. We're so taken up with our own comforts. We don't like things to be different. We don't like things to change. Oh Lord, we pray that you would Give us a real desire to grow in our own faith and to see this gospel of God going forth in our city. We long for that day when you will come amongst us in a mighty awakening. To that end, we give ourselves to you, Lord. We pray that we would Think much about these things this week. We pray that we be much in prayer for the Lord's day. We pray, Lord, that you would so work in our midst that our church here in St. George's Tron would become all that you mean it to be. We pray again for the young people, for the students. We pray for the children growing up through Sunday school and Bible class. We pray for those who are just beginning to come around the building because they're seeing something here that's attracting them. Lord, draw them to yourself. Draw more young people into our prayer meeting, into our Bible study, into our fellowship. And Lord, send us forth into this part of the city into the places we live as your ambassadors. Lord, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you that you are such a wonderful God. We thank you that you use just ordinary folks like us. We thank you that with your spirit within us. We are a match for anybody. Lord, go with us now to our homes and to our work for this week. Help us to be real witnesses there too. May your grace, mercy and peace be our portion now and always. Amen.